So maybe we can get started. And uh, today there are two topics, webinar seminars. And uh, one from uh, University of Hong Kong, Professor Tu. And uh, he will address on the treatment, uh, the diagnosis of the COVID-19. And uh, he's published so many papers, including the Lancet infectious diseases. So maybe the uh, Dr. Lo Alto from uh, Hong Kong University, could you start your lecture, please? So thank you, Professor Omata, and uh, thank you for the organizing committee for your invitation, uh, especially Professor Lam. So uh, this is my first time to speak in liver conference, and I'm delighted to share my experience with you with regarding the uh, rapid biological diagnosis of COVID-19. So actually, um, just a little bit of background about COVID-19. Uh, now, actually, more than 12 million people have laboratory confirmed uh, infection, and uh, the mortality rate is about 5% or 550,000 deaths now. Um, the virus that's causing it is very similar to SARS, but so that's why it's called SARS-2, and it's actually belonged to lineage B of beta coronavirus. And this gene is actually composed of a lot of uh, a few different um, uh, we so-called other human coronavirus, including HKU1, OC43, SARS-CoV, and MERS-CoV. And of course, HKU1 is, was uh, discovered by my uh, boss, Professor Patrick Wu and Professor uh, K.Y. Yun in 2004. So why do I have to talk about diagnosis? Is because um, as illustrated by this COVID-19 pandemic, it has made a tremendous impact on both patient management and public health. Uh, for patient management, actually early diagnosis is very, very important because uh, there have been numerous trials that shows that there's now effective treatment. So um, in our department or in our uh, university, Professor Ivan Hong from uh, Department of Medicine, who's also a gastroenterologist, um, he has carried out a triple therapy clinical trial which shows the combination of interferon beta 1b plus calitra plus ribavirin actually uh, shortens the duration of uh, treatment uh, of symptoms. And of course, the famous remdesivir, this has been shown to reduce the duration of symptoms. And uh, this morning, I saw that it also reduces the uh, mortality rate as well. And in England, they announced the very successful trial with dexamethasone, which they uh, giving dexamethasone actually um, reduce the mortality rate. So diagnosis is also very important for public health because you can only uh, stop transmission if you can identify the infected patients. So first of all, by identifying these uh, patients, some of them can have no symptoms at all. Then you can isolate them, quarantine them. This will greatly reduce the transmission in the community. And this is practiced in Hong Kong and many other parts, especially of the world, especially in China and other parts of Asia. And actually accurate diagnosis is very important to provide uh, epidemiological information so that we know exactly how many patients are infected. So we know whether we have a rising trend or a, a, a downward trend. Uh, for example, unfortunately in Hong Kong recently, we have uh, a rise in cases. Uh, because of the uh, um, stopping of the lockdown, uh, social distancing policies. So this has, um, uh, so accurate diagnosis makes us aware of the, uh, this current outbreak. So to understand the diagnosis, uh, I'll show you something about the virus itself. So this is the virion. Um, the surface is actually coated with a surface protein called uh, a spike protein. And the spike protein contains the receptor binding domain that binds to the whole cell. Inside there are other proteins. Uh, one important one is nuclear protein. And of course, there's an RNA um, in the, uh, inside the virion. The RNA is a single-stranded RNA, uh, which can be uh, uh, post-translationally uh, cleaved into different uh, proteins. So for diagnosis, as in other infections, either we detect the virus or we detect the antibody. For the virus, of course, we can detect the RNA or protein. 
Um, for RNA, the mainstay is still the uh, RT-PCR. There are other variations, for example, those isothermal amplification uh, techniques or the detection not by fluorescent probes, but rather by a uh, so-called CRISPR uh, uh, technique. So for to detect proteins, of course, we use antigen detection. Uh, now there's, there's many forms of natural flow uh, assays to do that. And for detect detection of antibody response, uh, there are different formats, including ELISA, lateral flow, and also magnetic beads. Um, neutralization assay uh, is one of the best assay, but unfortunately, uh, we need a uh, biosafety level three laboratory to do this assay. Um, and so uh, nowadays, there's also pseudovirus type neutralization assay. So actually, I mean, it's only seven months since the beginning of the of the uh, outbreak pandemic, but there's already many, many um, uh, commercial kits available. This was published in May, there's many more now. So there are, there are uh, uh, commercial tests for antibodies, for antigens, or for detection of the RNA. Um, so actually we are using, uh, uh, some of these we are actually using now. So first I want to talk about the detection of RNA. There are many targets in the gene that we can use. Um, these are, the, are as shown in the uh, uh, blue arrows. These are usually highly expressed and usually more conserved uh, in the genome. So most of the uh, RT-PCR now either use the nuclear protein gene or the envelope protein gene, and some use this uh, LDRP uh, gene. Actually, this whole um, uh, red or orange section is the so-called open reading frame 1AB or OR 1AB, and some of the targets are actually within this um, gene. So in the beginning of the outbreak, many groups have developed uh, uh, RT-PCR assays for COVID, and these were shared by to the WHO, and many of us have benefited from these uh, different assays. However, there's one problem with these assays, well, just like any other um, virus detection, is that because when the virus mutates, if the mutation occurs in the primer or the probe binding site, this can affect the, uh, the sensitivity of the RT-PCR assay. And so one of the main things that we have to monitor is whether there's mutation occurring at the primer protein sites or, or or probe binding sites of these uh, uh, assays. And actually in this paper, they have um, a search for uh, viral genomes that have mutations. And actually for some of the uh, rt cell assays that have been recommended to WHO in the beginning of the pandemic, we can already see uh, mutations at the primer or the probe binding sites. For example, this particular prime, the ones that I highlighted, are the primers that has 100%, uh, I mean, there's at least one mutations in the, uh, uh, in the primer or probe binding site. So actually I'm sure more and more of these mutations may uh, come about and these may actually affect the sensitivity of the COVID rt cell assays and may necessity upgrade, updating these primers and probes. And because of this reason, we must have different uh, targets or RT-PCR assays. Because if one, if we have multiple assays, then even if one assay doesn't work as well, we have other assays to work with. So that's why our department has been uh, uh, developing different RT-PCR assays. So RDLP helicase is the first one that we developed. Later, we also found uh, uh, RT-PCR assays for NP NSP1 protein or uh, NSP1 protein or NSP2 uh, protein or gene. And actually, the, how do we identify these uh, regions? Uh, one of the things is we have to identify highly expressed regions. So we use nanopore sequencing, which is a long uh, sequencing technique. Um, when we sequence patient specimens, we found very high expression at the NSP1 gene. So we developed the assay against this gene and we found that it's actually very comparable sensitivity with the uh, other recommended um, N-gene or V-gene RT-PCR. 
So um, I think it's very important for RT-PCR assays to have multiple targets to avoid uh, the problem with mutations. So, so the ones that I mentioned are usually uh, require uh, that so then so non-automatic in the sense that we need to do uh, RNA extraction and then you have to do the real-time RTQ-PCR. But nowadays there are some automated molecular tests, which is I call it all in one test. Basically, you put in a sample, and then 15 minutes or an hour later, they can give you the result. You don't have to do any extraction or PCR yourself. So there are several uh, essays available. I'll just show you some the pictures of some of them. So actually, we use these in our clinical practice now, and it's actually they show very very good um, sensitivity and specificity as compared to our traditional uh, manual uh, molecular assays. Um, and in this evaluation, we actually use we actually try to use different uh, types of specimens uh, in one of the uh, auto, uh, automated assays. And we found very similar results between nasal pharyngeal swab and saliva. Um, saliva is a, uh, is a very convenient uh, sample type, and so that's why we invented it as well. So we, in this essay, we show very good uh, results for both saliva and NPS in different gene targets within the automated machine. And um, as you can see, um, they, in, for example, in this particular uh, point of care essay, which is called Gene Expert, um, they have two different targets, the D gene target and the nuclear protein gene target. Um, the CT values is very comparable, actually, for these. So actually, um, we can use saliva in these point of care assays as well, in addition to the more traditional uh, nasal pharyngeal swab. Actually, the use of saliva is, has been used in Hong Kong very successfully and increasingly used in other countries or regions. And this is a paper from the Yale University. Actually, when they did a study, they actually found a slightly better result for saliva than nasopharyngeal swab. So this is very encouraging because uh, saliva is just much easier to collect than nasopharyngeal swab. And actually, we use saliva not just for diagnosis, and, but also for monitoring of the disease. Um, this is our study um, uh, uh, published in March, in which we show very high viral load in the beginning of the illness, and the viral load actually decreased uh, as uh, the disease progressed. Actually, this high viral load can explain why there's a high transmissibility in the community. And actually, we use saliva to monitor the viral load in this uh, uh, triple combination clinical trial as well, which shows very clearly the decrease in viral load after treatment. There are newer techniques. Um, so there are two main isothermal amplification techniques. The main advantage of these new techniques is to allow point of care testing more easily and faster results. So for example, with this so-called recombinant polymerase amplification, the result actually the fastest can be read, can be uh, uh, the results will be available. The fastest is like five minutes. And actually, it can be developed into a portable OS quite easily. Um, there's another one which is developed by Professor Charles Chiu at um, in uh, 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 California, where basically they developed uh, the so-called uh, isothermal amplification technique, the LAM. And after this isothermal amplification, the detection can be instead of just a normal probe, they use the Cas12. Um, uh, a system to detect the amplicon, and which can then be detected by a lateral flow uh, fissure rate out assay. So basically, um, this is the assay that they use, and you can actually read the results in these uh, lateral flow assay, which is very convenient. One of the this, these are assays are very good. The only problem is that the sensitivity is not as good as the traditional RT-PCR assays. And these, and these assays are still not um, uh, 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 widely available yet. So unfortunately for the moment, we still have to rely on the traditional RT-PCR assay or the automated molecular assay. But hopefully these newer techniques will come about in the near future. So I just want to mention briefly about antigen detection. It's now available, but 
actually is not very good. Um, the low limit of detection of antigen assays actually is hundred a thousand times higher than viral culture and hundred thousand times higher than RT PCR. So it has a very quite a low sensitivity. For example, in this paper published by our public health uh, government uh, lab, they found a sensitivity of only 11.1% to 45% among RT-PCR positive cases. And there's another study actually from Japan. And in this study, they evaluated different um, antigen assays. They also found a very poor sensitivity of the um, of the, uh, these antigen assays. Basically, these antigen assays can only detect viruses when it's only with very high viral load or CT value, as you can see here. So a lot have been talked about antibody assays as well, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. However, more and more studies are available now showing that antibody assay is not good for a diagnosis, uh, especially in the early phase of the illness. Um, it's very simple because it takes time for the, uh, for the body, for the host to develop antibodies against the virus. So in our study, we show that uh, most of the patients actually develop um, IgG response after uh, day 10 of symptom onset, uh, either for both severe case and mild cases. Another study looking at different commercially available antibody assay so they find that from day, most of the patients do not have antibody response from day one to five after, after uh, disease onset. Uh, even from day six or 10, there's still many negative cases. It's only after day 11 that uh, most people would have antibody response. So in the first 10 days, it's not useful um, to test antibody. So in summary, uh, for laboratory diagnosis, the current state of Diagnosis is still detecting the RNA. Uh, by RT-PCR, it's a gold standard. It's very sensitive and specific. And this is the only useful test in acute phase of the illness. And furthermore, it actually can be detect, they can detect um, uh, uh, viruses during the so-called pre-symptomatic phase, so before the symptom onset. Antibody is not useless. It's very useful if you use it in some acute or convalescent phase, as you can see, most of the patients are positive uh, after day 11. And um, it's actually very useful for retrospective diagnosis and very important for public health uh, surveillance, especially this because zero surveillance, uh, because many patients actually do not seek medical attention at the time of illness. So these are so-called subclinical infections. And uh, at least in, in Singapore, they have shown very clearly that antibody testing can be used for contact tracing to identify the source of an outbreak. So um, this is the end of my presentation, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Professor To. Uh, any uh, question from the panelists? This was a, a beautiful... Uh... Uh, this is Vlad Ratu talking. Uh, congratulations, B beautiful presentation, actually. And I would j simply have a question regarding the, the whether the IgM detection is useful or not. I understand antibodies uh, do not appear early on during the early phases of infection. But if you, in ambiguous situations, since PCR also has negative, uh, false negative results, is there any use to, to, to look specifically for IgM antibodies in the subacute phase or later shortly after the acute phase of the infection to make the distinction between someone who had the infection three months ago or someone who just had the infection right now? Thank you, Professor Rasu, for your question. Actually, very strangely for COVID, IgM does not necessarily appear before IgG. Actually, in our study, a lot of the patients have the rise of IgM at the same time as IgG or even after IgG. Actually, this has been shown in other studies as well, uh, especially the larger ones uh, published in the high impact journals. In the beginning, some studies say IgM appears before IgG, but at least in our hands and in many other people, it's not true. So um, IgM, in my opinion, does not really help to improve or, or, or make it earlier detection. But I have to say that uh, what you say is very correct. In RT-PCR, 
so-called borderline cases or indeterminate case, antibody can be very important. Uh, this morning, I just received a call asking us if, whether we can do antibody testing for a patient with a CT value of 41. Um, what my answer is that if the patient has a the symptom onset of more than 10 days, I think um, this, the antibody test will be quite accurate. But if it's less than 10 days, even if it's a negative test, it's better to repeat it again a few days later, see if there's any serial confirmation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is uh, Dr. Wei, Mr. Yes, Wen? I have a question. I think it's a very nice talk. Uh, my question is regarding the saliva test. So uh, would anything, perhaps, for instance, after eating or after drinking, any other, other taking something in the mouth, would that uh, interfere with the uh, results of the saliva test? And also, has the, the saliva test been used uh, generally or only in certain area or certain people? Thank you, Professor Wen, for the question. Um, for us, we always ask patients to collect saliva before eating. So what we do is, usually we say, try to get it the first thing uh, you do when you wake up. So before brushing your teeth or before uh, eating. So to avoid any food junk. Because when I did the first study on saliva, uh, I didn't mention this and I see a lot of food in the saliva as well. And this can um, affect the assay. Um, so this first thing. Um, and in Hong Kong, actually, we do it for, uh, uh, for screening tests in the public. So for example, we've, uh, in recent days, we have outbreaks. So uh, everybody in a housing estate will provide saliva sample for testing, mainly because it's logistically much easier. Uh, because when you have thousands of patients, it's quite impossible to deploy a large number of healthcare workers to collect nasopharyngeal aspirin or swab. So we use saliva. Uh, thank, no, thank you for the professor uh, Wen. I have a similar I, questions because I, during your lecture, this is Dr. Mata, during your lecture, I just got a phone call from my hospital by saying we took a nasopharyngeal swabs and then the saliva, and then the saliva was negative, but the nasopharyngeal uh, swab was positive. So do you do the head-to-head -head comparison about patients? Because uh, as you say, it might be very easy to take the saliva for epidemiological studies, but in the hospitals, we need a more accurate, you know, the titers and then the antigen labels. So my experience is not necessary. the saliva taking any tricks for that? So actually, the, uh, this has been looked at by different studies. Uh, men, actually, several studies, as the one as I've shown you from, from Yale University, the actual saliva is not worse than NP nasopharyngeal swab. Mm -hmm. From our own experience, we know that the saliva, the viral load is, uh, is a little lower than uh, nasopharyngeal swab. So in our hands, the sensitivity is a little lower, a few percentage lower than uh, nasopharyngeal swab. So uh, to increase the yield, I think the first thing is that we sh if somebody can actually produce, I mean, when, when, I, when I say saliva, what we do is we ask them to try to uh, uh, bring the saliva from the deep throat. So we call it deep throat saliva. So because we believe those secretions at the back of the throat contain secretions coming down from the nasopharynx and also uh, secretions swapping up from the airways. And we believe those uh, secretions at the back of the throat is best. Uh, uh, for that has the highest viral load. Another important thing is that if somebody has sputum production, ask them to cough out sputum. Don't just, you know, not, you don't need to use saliva if somebody can cough out sputum. Because sputum in our experience have really have higher viral load than saliva. Saliva is most useful in those patients who cannot cough out sputum. So if somebody can cough out sputum, ask them to cough out sputum. If not, saliva is a good alternative uh, when compared to nasopharyngeal swab. So when cough out one, uh, so first thing is to try to get it from deep throat or the back of the throat. And second is that try to ask the patient to uh, spit out at least one to two mils of saliva. Because if it's just one or two drops of saliva, it's very difficult for the lab to actually test it adequately. 
But if you can provide one to two mils of saliva, this is very good. And third, it's very important to transport the specimen to the laboratory as soon as possible. Um, in our center, we always use viral transport medium because we know that there can be delays in the transport. Um, in some places, if this is not possible, then try to uh, tra uh, transport it as soon as possible. This can also improve. All right, thank you, To. Uh, we want to take more inviting uh, many questions from the panel. Uh -huh. Any questions from the panel? Yes, uh, I have an important uh, question for you, Dr. Kelvin. Uh, if you have a patient uh, and you do a rapid antigen test, which is negative, will you recommend doing a RT-PCR uh, in every patient? We know that RT-PCR is three to four log better than rapid antigen test. So every time we have a patient who is to be admitted, we do rapid antigen test. But if it is negative, we do RT-PCR. So what is your advice for our uh, patients to be admitted? I think if a patient is in hospital, especially, I would definitely go for RT-PCR instead of antigen test. Because antigen test is just, the sensitivity is just very, very low um, compared to RT-PCR. So for any, if it's possible, if whenever possible, use RT-PCR. I think antigen test should only be used if RTP cell cannot be performed or too expensive to be Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. To. And uh, today we're gonna have the second talk from the France and uh, Professor Ratsu uh, from France. And then topic of his is uh, why do so many Nash trials fail? So could you start the lecture, please? Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, share the screen. Should. Uh, yeah, I can see you. I can see yeah, you. Yeah, but I can't see myself. Yourself. You can see yourself. No, no, but I. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, I see. This is how we do it. So, sorry. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Thank you very much for the invitation, uh, both uh, professors Omata, George Lau, and Shiv Sarin, and everybody else. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be to be sharing this with with you and with the other uh, puzzle members. So I was asked to present, uh, I guess, because we wrote a, a small piece uh, recently uh, trying to understand these puzzling uh, failures of all these Nash trials. And I would start by saying that we must first remember the overall objective in, in treating a patient with NASH and also in the NASH trials that we're currently conducting. And the overall objective, this needs to be kept in mind, is to inhibit or, or uh, stop progression to cirrhosis. This is, this is what we're trying to achieve when we treat people with NASH and particularly in non-cirrhotic NASH trials. Now, of course, in order to do that, you have to do some patient selection and usually only patients with uh, already advanced established fibrosis are being included in these trials. Uh, now, the second thing I would like to remind you is the regulatory framework for approval of drugs, at least theoretical framework for approval of drugs in NASH. So these uh, trials, um, first we're, we're facing a situation where um, th th there is no treatment for the moment. Uh, so in this case, uh, something has been set in place by the agencies, which is a two-step process of approval. The first one is a conditional approval, which is based on achieving some early endpoints. And the second one is a definitive approval, which is based on achieving clinical hard outcomes. The conditional approval uh, can be given in theory if two, one or two histological endpoints have been met. First of all is disappearance of NASH, Second is reversal of fibrosis, meaning uh, going back one or several stages in the fibrosis process. Once you have done that, the trial needs to continue in order to prove that if these two um, interim endpoints have been met, there is a clinical translation in terms of meeting hard clinical endpoints. And those are defined, and this is very important, in two different ways. The first one is progression to cirrhosis. 
So progression to cirrhosis is not strictly speaking a, a clinical endpoint, but we all know that once a patient develops cirrhosis, whatever liver disease you're talking about, uh, the prognosis becomes significantly uh, uh, altered. So progression to cirrhosis, even defined histologically, is considered a hard clinical endpoint. And then, of course, you have the clinical endpoints per se, which are all the complications of cirrhosis and death. If, you, if, if the trial reaches these two clinical endpoints, then you get definitive approval. Now, there, have been, there are many drugs in development, and I think they can be classified in different families. Uh, the FXR FGF19 uh, class of drugs uh, is one of the first one that emerged. PPARs as well. You can see here some of the molecules that are in development and in small print. Um, the biotech companies or the larger pharma that develop these drugs. There are also a, a large, uh, it's a large basket of in, in metabolic drugs that are currently being developed, whether you're talking about drugs that inhibit lipogenesis, like a CD1 inhibitor, uh, whether you're talking about drugs that modulate metabolic actions like FGF21, and there are several of these in development, uh, the tyromimetics as well. So this is another important family. A, a fourth family are the anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrotic drugs. Unfortunately, many of those failed so far. And then you have many drugs in development that uh, which main mechanism of action is weight loss, and those include some very popular diabetes drugs. So this is a little bit, in a simplified way, the landscape in development. Now, although there are many uh, drugs in development, and basically they all make sense from a pathophysiological point of view, it has been very uh, strange to, to see that many of these trials failed. And this is just a, a, a short uh, synopsis of some of the trials that have recently reported negative results in NASH. And you can see there are uh, a few, actually three large phase three trials, uh, whether in pre-serotic or serotic patients that failed, and then uh, many phase two B trials in different populations ranging from those with minimal fibrosis to those with advanced cirrhosis with portal hypertension that have failed as well. So this is very unfortunate and it brings us to the question of whether we can even though we just started this process of, of developing drugs in NASH trials, whether we can understand a little bit the, the reasons uh, behind these many uh, failures. And a lot uh, is already being started to be uh, written about this. This is a, a recent, very nice editorial came in the Journal of Hepatology regarding the failure of the Stellar Four Ceylon 13 trials. So um, I would first talk about two major truly important methodological issues, one of them dealing with central pathology assessment. So there is a lot to say here, but I would simply cite a paper that will come out in the Journal of Hepatology soon, actually you can read it in press, where the results of uh, a trial with, with an insulin sensitizer, uh, which is a, a sort of a glitazone-like molecule, have been reanalyzed by using not only the initial pathologist, but two additional pathologies that have read the same slides uh, according to a, a, a predefined order. And you, this paper very nicely shows that uh, there are many, there's a lot of discordance between the different pathologists and actually the number of cases where they agree is, is very low. So this brings into question uh, the use of a single central reader and also, for, in a more broader view, brings into question the whole process of reading the slides. And without going to detail, this is something that is very actively debated currently between the different sponsors and the agencies, and that every NASH trial has to fail. We still have not found the best way to read the slides, whether you read them after the trial, before the trial, whether you reread the baseline and so on and so forth. There are a lot of issues that are still need clarification and we're only in the process of starting to, to identify the different issues that are at stake. The second problem uh, it relates to issues with how do you define the endpoint? So it can be pretty straightforward if you think about fibrosis reversal. It can be a lot more complicated if you think about reversal or resolution or disappearance of NASH. Uh, as an example, I would like to give you a, a small uh, hypothetical uh, case here uh, in order for you to understand that if we only look at the positive side of this, which is how many people 
regress by one stage of more fibrosis, we might not get a good understanding of the ultimate objective, which is again, progression to cirrhosis. So imagine here a drug X compared to placebo that gives you 20% of people having a reversal by one stage or more in fibrosis versus only 10% in placebo, which is what you'd expect. This difference is highly significant, of course, depending on the sample size. And this, this happened in a recent trial. Now, if your overall objective, though, is to prevent progression to cirrhosis, if it happens, if it so happens that you have the same proportion of patients that worsen, despite a larger proportion of people who improve, then the number of patients that ultimately will develop cirrhosis will be the same, uh, and uh, especially in the short term. So therefore, simply looking at the number of people who improve is not sufficient. But then you can say, you know, looking at the number of people who get worse only, it's not sufficient either. Like you can see here in scenario number two, imagine you have 5% of people get better, 95, 90% of people that get better in the comparator arm, but then 5% of people that worsen in both arms. Of course, the same number of people will progress to cirrhosis, but clearly there is an antifibrotic benefit here as well. And then there's a, another scenario where you can get more people that improve, but also more people that worsen with a drug. So then in the end, is that drug better than the comparator? All this needs to be worked out. Uh, a simple way to express results, and this has been done in the Regenerate study that, that you can see uh, here, it was published recently, is to look both at the number of people who worsen, the number of people who, who progress in terms of fibrosis, and if uh, in, in comparison with the placebo arm, you have more people that reverse and less people than progress, which is the case with the high dose of alpha-glycolic acid, then probably uh, there will be an overall benefit in terms of the antifibrotic uh, relevance of the drug. Another aspect I would like to, to discuss is how good are preclinical data in predicting efficacy in humans? And this is, of course, a central piece of the whole uh, 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 process that we, we apply in, in drug development because you always start with preclinical data. It seems like for some people, you never have enough preclinical data, but for every one of us, you have to decide based on these preclinical data whether you go ahead with human trials or not. So the question of whether this is translatable uh, or the, the question of the translation of value is key to the, to the decision-making process. There have been some recent studies that have shown both in NASH, but also in a larger sense in inflammatory diseases, that there is actually very little overlap, in, both in terms of gene levels and pathway levels uh, between the mouse uh, models of liver disease uh, here on the left and, and the human models of liver disease. Uh, and actually the same thing has happened in, in several inflammatory diseases. I think septic shock was uh, uh, analyzed in this PNAS paper. And this, unfortunately, because of this discrepancy here, a lot of failures have been uh, um, noted, uh, occurred in, in trials aiming to uh, improve with anti-inflammatory agents, septic shock or, or other uh, systemic inflammatory conditions. And this has been very well shown. Uh, in that particular literature. So very few common pathways despite common pathological images uh, in these, between the human disease and uh, these um, clinical models. Another uh, important issue when you look at how do you use animal data, particularly rodent data, in trying to gain understanding and whether a drug would be effective in humans, comes from a beautiful paper from Barbara Rehrman's group in the United States where they have shown that basically not all mice are alike. And in particular, something happened to lab mice that, uh, that we use for these experiments that totally uh, altered their, uh, their behavior, their genetic uh, background, uh, the way that their genes interfere with different stimuli. Actually, they're very different from wild mice and while wild mice and humans share basically the same um, processes in the way they react to diseases. Uh, this is not the case for laboratory mice. And actually, if you, if you, if you uh, design offsprings of laboratory mice with genes that come from truly wild mice, then you get much closer to the human 
um, environment than you would if you would keep using lab mice, which is what we do currently. So even lab mice, even, even if you take away the disease process and pathways, just the simple fact that using mice that have been for many generations bred in the lab, in the laboratory environment with a particular laboratory microbiota and so on, makes it that you do not have reliable animals that can uh, reliably predict translation to human diseases. So that is very problematic. And finally, another important thing that everybody, every one of us tries to struggle with is how do you interpret the data from the animals? Suppose you have a difference uh, when you're using these animal models in a particular parameter that gets reduced, for instance, say collagen one expression or whatever, oxidative stress, and that reduction that you see is significant with a small sample size we use in animals, how significant, how will that translate into human disease? And basically everybody gets very excited about these small differences here, particularly if they're significant, but maybe what, and then you move on to human trials, you realize they fail. And maybe the fact is that here we should, we may want to have a much stronger response, at least numerically, in animals in order to be sure that this might translate somehow to humans. And we should be much more stringent in, in what we consider to be a positive response, not just simply a lower value with some measure of statistical significance. So the relevance of that is usually not strong enough. So we overemphasize the importance of that. So going on with some other um, important uh, uh, preclinical data that might impact them is of course the fact that uh, ma many, many times we, we go towards, we rush into clinical trials without truly understanding the target biology and whether it plays a role in the disease pathogenesis. We don't really understand whether the target itself is sufficiently modulated in human disease, whether it goes up or down sufficiently so that you can try to manipulate it. We not always have biomarkers, pharmacodynamic biomarkers of target engagement. Um, another important point is that all these mechanisms for NASH, NASH is a, it's not a viral disease like COVID-19, at least in the way that the viral multiplication uh, since it is a very complex mechanism uh, and sometimes different mechanisms can be redundant and take over the ones that you're trying to block with a particular drug so then there is no net effect and then the, we also very often rush into clinical trials without making sure that what we see is corroborated for instance we have an inhibition of a target is corroborated by also by studies of genetic inactivation different ways to pharmacologically inhibit that, not only through the drug, but also through antisense, small interference RNAs, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't have a very good understanding of whether knocking down that particular uh, molecular target, how, however you do it, always results in an improvement of the disease. I talked about the insufficient magnitude and consistency of the effect, but that, that also is important. There are different ways to measure and the antifibrotic effect you can measure collagen, you can measure smooth muscle actin, you can measure morphometric area, you can measure histological fibrosis stage. All these has to be consistent. Uh, and uh, hopefully you have to see a strong effect on each one of these parameters if you hope that when moving into humans, you'll have a positive impact. And also another important thing is that we all, always overemphasize the importance of positive effects, like for instance, on fibrosis, without truly looking whether this comes together with a wider range of effects, also uh, uh, in terms of other aspects of liver injury as well. Let's move on to the third aspect, which is the heterogeneity of the disease. This is a very hotly debated topic nowadays. And it makes sense because if the disease, so say COVID-19 is just a virus, it has multiple clinical uh, manifestations, but it's still at the basis of it, one virus. This is a very complex disease and understanding the heterogeneity of the disease might help us understanding why some patients don't respond in trials. Why? How does that work? Um, well, first of all, depending on the predominant mechanism of injury, you might have a different response to the drug you're trying to use. And then there's also other parameters uh, reflected by the heter heterogeneity, such as the inter-individual variation, the different disease subtypes, 
and they all result both into a variable natural history or into a variable response to drugs. So suppose you use a metabolic drug, well, the inflammatory process is predominant. Of course, you want to be as efficient uh, in, in that particular setting. So since it is very difficult to understand just from looking at the pathology slide, which is the predominant mechanism of, of, of injury in a particular patient, uh, we are bound not to clearly understand what we're doing with these drugs. An example of heterogeneity in terms of disease subtypes is the interference and the impact uh, and, and the mutual synergy between alcohol and metabolic uh, causes of liver disease. This is a very nice uh, diagram taken from Jacob George and uh, Mohammed Eslam's studies recently published, where you can see that actually in real life, a lot of people, there are many people who don't drink alcohol at all and have NASH, that's for sure. But there are also many people who drink alcohol and have metabolic dysfunction. And then there's a whole spectrum of whether you're looking at the extremes, teetotalers in one case, people with excessive uh, consumption of alcohol in the other case, this is alcoholic predominant or metabolic pre pre predominant fatty liver. But there's also a lot of people in the middle where you can have more of the metabolic uh, balance of the disease, more of the alcoholic balance of the disease, or a strict balance between the two. And of course, if you use drugs that are purely anti-metabolic, then and if the patient is in these categories in the middle, you won't, it won't be successful. Another striking example of heterogeneity is that what we take for metabolic liver, uh, fatty liver in some patients might be due to some totally independent uh, causes. This is a beautiful study from China that have shown that a few people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease actually have uh, a microbiota that produces large amounts of alcohol that can be responsible of the, the fatty liver uh, and therefore, of course, treating uh, these patients with uh, FGF21 or obeticolic acid will not necessarily eliminate what you need here is antibiotics, at least in animals, to get rid of those nasty uh, my, uh, bugs that, that produce alcohol. So this is just uh, uh, an anecdote to understand the importance of how uh, disease processes can impact uh, the uh, success of a drug. And then we go finally into some clinical aspects uh, that certainly need to be discussed. The first one is that because we're so in a hurry, of course, from a clinical point of view, but also in terms of corporate uh, reasons, because a lot of these drugs are developed by, by small biotechs that do not have years and years to wait for return on investment, we're really in a hurry to develop drugs. And sometimes we go ahead without sufficient demonstration uh, of proof of concept in early trials. Uh, and sometimes we, we just cannot get that demonstration. Let me, let me explain. Early phase trials, particularly phase 2A trials, what you want to do is to demonstrate biological action of a drug. And you use short-term studies with re relatively small number of patients. Now, depending on the drug, uh, we either have many ways to measure the effects or very few and very unreliable ways to measure the effects. Suppose you're looking at a metabolic drug, you can look at the effect in terms of insulin sensitivity, lipid dysfunction, glycemic parameters, amount of fat in the liver. Everything can be measured quite non-invasively in a very quantitative way. Suppose you look at the drug that is primarily anti-inflammatory, uh, then we have less things. Of course, the good old ALT values are indicative, but you know they have shortcomings. We have some circulating inflammatory markers, but the relationship with the liver injury is not perfect. So there's already less things to be used in this case. And then you have drugs that are primarily antifibrotic. And what happens here is that particularly in short-term trials, because you can't do a proof of concept trial that spans over two years. In that case, we have very few things to measure. Of course, there are biomarkers of fibrosis, but we lack totally understanding of whether these biomarkers in the short term uh, uh, predict fibrosis improvement uh, in longer trials. So sometimes it's our fault because we rush too, too much. Sometimes it's simply we don't have the tools. Another critical issue is the very high false discovery rate in phase two trials. So without going into detail, let me just give you an example here. This is probably one of the best examples in the field. A solancerty, uh, a, a molecule, it totally makes sense to use it in NASH 
for many reasons, here is a first study, phase two trial, that has shown uh, effect. And based on this, a lot, two large phase three trials have been conducted. Ultimately, the phase three trials failed. Now, what is interesting here is that if you look at these results, they're highly positive. The problem is, so you see 43% one stage reduction in fibrosis at the high dose, dose dependent relationship, only 20% in the control arm, fine. The problem with that is that if you interpret that without taking into account the sample size, you can see here very small sample sizes here, without taking into account other supporting evidence. In this trial, there was no effect on ALT, for instance. Uh, in this trial, there was no, there, there was no dose-related response in terms of measuring liver stiffness, as you can see at the bottom lane in the table. So in other words, small sample size, no supportive evidence from other ways to measure the antifibrotic effect. And then you go from here because you're so uh, enthusiastic about this 43% versus 20% difference, you go on to do a phase three trial and that phase three trial fails. So the problem is that not only we have to look at primary outcomes, whether they're positive in these small trials, but also all the secondary outcomes need to be going in the same direction. And, uh, and, and even if that is the case, the simple fact that we're using few patients for arms make it that there's still a very large probability that with larger samples, the molecule will no longer be positive. Another thing that is important is the stage of the disease. Uh, sometimes we're trying to do too much. Sometimes we're trying to do, treat people uh, with cirrhosis. And it may be that for the drugs we have so far, uh, it is too late. Let's take an example here. How does that work? Well, um, when you're including patients with cirrhosis, what can you try to achieve with a drug? You can try to achieve two things, either to prevent that they, these people further decompensate and have complications of cirrhosis, or you can try to reverse the disease and make a, a significant proportion of those going back to stage three or stage two or, or earlier stages of fibrosis. Now, in order to do that, this is a very fine balance in terms of choosing the type of cirrhotics that you put in these trials because it is understandable that if you put in these trials cirrhotics that are too early in the process, you'll never have enough events to prove that you prevented the compensation. If you put in these trials patients that are too advanced so that you can get more events, then you'll never get enough fibrosis reversal because it's too late. So there are some uh, parameters that are used, in other words, to stratify uh, patients with cirrhosis in order to understand which one are at higher risk in the short term to, to progress, and those are of course, child pube, meld, portal pressure with a portal gradient, whether there are varices or not, whether there has been a history of decompensation. Some people use fibro scan values, other measure the thickness of the fibro receptor. None of these are perfect. So basically, we, we still lack good measures of stratifying patients with cirrhosis, both in terms of risk of reversion of the disease and risk of decompensation. And that's why probably many cirrhotic trials fail. Importantly, particularly if you deal with cirrhotic trials, we're focusing too much on the fibrotic aspect while forgetting what we very well know in clinical practice that many of the reasons these people to compensate might not have something to do with the fibrotic process per se. And if you use drugs that do not control for some of the mechanisms that induce the deadly complications of cirrhosis, which for instance, are related to portal hypertension, are related to infection, to bacterial translocation, then these drugs have no chance at reducing the clinical events. There are very few drugs that have the ability to improve something else than just inflammation or fibrosis. And there are even fewer drugs that have been tested in that regard. This is an, uh, an exception. Uh, an FXR agonist that has been tested in this very nice paper here in terms of ability to reduce portal pressure, to remodel the vasculature of the liver, uh, to restore the balance between vasodilators and vasoconstrictors, improve in the theoretical dysfunction, also reduce bacterial translocation, as you can see here. Uh, but very few drugs are able to do that. And then it, because these mechanisms are so important in in, in triggering cirrhotic decompensation, if you don't control for them, understandably, your trial will fail. 
Now, my last slide would be to tell you that in the end, we should not be uh, 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 we should not be abated by too much pessimism here. Sometimes these trials work, and I have uh, put together in, on this slide some of uh, the uh, results we already have, but also uh, some of the uh, very recent results that have been reported mainly through press releases. You see here is some aglutide results and those of lamifibrinor. So some studies have shown that these particular agents are able either to uh, get rid of NASH or to improve fibrosis. So there is hope that with, if we choose well the pharmacological agents, if we're able to identify better the population to treat and those not to treat, and if we, do, if we conduct the right trials patiently, we might end up having a good, uh, a good final success. So in conclusion, uh, a very temporary conclusion, of course, because we just started to understand this whole process, I would say that uh, there are very important issues that we're trying right now to solve, particularly with the agencies regarding the procedures of reading uh, the slides and how do we define them. Uh, you will read the JHAP paper that came out and you'll understand that maybe it's time for us to totally drop uh, pathology here and start moving on to biomarkers. There, there are now data with biomarkers and heart clinical outcomes. The lack of translational value of preclinical data is, is, is really a, a very big problem in trying to, to gain more understanding from preclinical models uh, and predictability. Uh, the insufficient documentation of efficacy before engaging in large and lengthy clinical trials is something very important and unfortunately is rarely done the way it should be done. Uh, and, uh, and that includes optimistic assessment over emphasizing uh, the importance of, of, of hand-picked positive results from phase two data. Cirrhotic trials have specific challenges, uh, which include lack of stratification for advanced versus early cirrhosis and, and the lack of uh, control of complex mechanisms contributing to these complications by the drugs we're using. Uh, however, there are quite a few encouraging and positive results that tell us that there is a uh, reason uh, to learn uh, and we're still, uh, we'll have a lot to learn in designing and conducting these NASH trials successfully. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the, maybe there are a couple of questions I can take. Any, any from the panelists? Well, uh, Valet, this is an uh, excellent uh, talk. Um, it's a very complicated issue, and I'm, I, I certainly think, and all of us would like to see how uh, the studies on fatty livers can be rebooted. Now, having said that, so we have a new nomenclature being proposed recently with MAFR, and in these uh, criteria, uh, a body mass index is a very important uh, criteria. Now, um, as a clinician, and I've been asked by many of my colleagues, the BMI for Asians is different, uh, uh, the criteria is used, is different from Caucasians. But then in Asians, how would you define Asians uh, uh, per se? Uh, Asians means uh, non-Caucasians, so who, who should be uh, considered as Asians? And uh, how solid are these uh, um, criteria because then we have to apply to our patients if it's used a new nomenclature. You're asking me how to define Asians? Uh, because the, the body mass <laughs> yeah. index. Well, yeah, I know. The deputy editor, the in chief of journal aptology. Yeah, I know. Well, but, the, um, first, the, once you have this uh, uh, conf, uh, difficulties in uh, defining, then you, you go into trials and how are we going to handle this? Uh, taking uh, enough heterogeneity involved in the definitions of the NASH itself or MAF, MAFR itself. Yeah. Well, I don't know how to define Asians. I mean, in historical way to define it is everybody is east of Bosphorus, but uh, it's probably not, not the right way. And populations are very mixed anyway. All these uh, studies have been done on self-declaration in the end, which is not very precise. Um, I, I, I don't... Uh, know how important that is because there is there is 90 percent overlap between the nash definition and the maffle definition uh but you're raising an important point and uh i think that uh for the moment liver biopsy is still important at least for identifying the disease and let's get rid of the bmi criteria at least for clinical trials 
uh, I think that um, uh, beyond BMI, because we only have 25 and 23 at thresholds, beyond BMI, waist circumference is also something important. But again, there is our ethnic criteria and thresholds that apply. So there is no easy answer to, to this uh, ethnic uh, definition. Um, however, I would simply want to tell you something that uh, we're having very, very uh, passionate discussions with our American colleagues. You got to be very careful for the moment that the MAFL definition makes a lot of sense, has been brilliantly and eloquently explained, especially in its rational by Jacob uh, George in particular and his colleague Aslam. For the moment, we have to wait until it is accepted by the scientific, not by me, not by Jacob, not by some journal, mm -hmm. by the scientific societies. Mm -hmm. And I think there will be a joint effort by ESL, ASLD, Apuzzle, and Alech, which is now starting to be scheduled for that. And I think we should wait for the issue of that, those discussions before widely using the term. Yeah, I think this is very important. Uh, um, uh, maybe I'll of the chair. Sorry. Okay. Well, I can take uh, two more questions. Yes, very brief, uh, Basa. Uh, yes. uh, Vlad, uh, I am party to this change in nomenclature, but my worry is when I saw these slides developing, we are having a much heterogeneous group now than a homogeneous Nash. And it is like ACLF, which has compensated chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, decompensated everything. So when you have the MAFLD, my worry is you have alcohol, cryptogenic, and you have fatty liver, and you have NASH, and you have normal weight and overweight. So I think we need to have a relook into the whole thing. Uh, just you are the leader, and I think George also wanted to say the same. Just to put the idea back into your mind. Thank you. I think wonderful two talks, and then we got to finish. One hour past. Thank you, everybody, and then see you after COVID 19. Sure. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.